All right. Thank you all so much for taking the time to hear about this work that I've been doing lately. I've titled it Quantity Calculus in Natural Language in order to pique the interest of uh, people who may be interested in things like quantity calculus. This is a field of metrology, the study of measures, uh, a, a sort of mathematical algebraic branch of it, which deals with the calculus of quantities, such as the temperature of a certain object or the wavelength of a certain radiation sample or the height of a particular individual. These are quantities. And uh, I have uh, been arguing that we should adopt tools from quantity calculus in order to explain phenomena in natural language. All right, so in uh, formal semantics, I am a formal semanticist. We have uh, borrowed from this, I this idea from mathematical logic that the denotation or truth of an expression can be given relative to a model. This was Richard Montague's idea. Uh, in the simplest case, a model is a pair consisting of a domain, that's a set of objects that we can talk about, and an interpretation function, which maps all of the non-logical constants of the logic in question, or the language in question, to individuals in the domain or sets, subsets of the domain or other combinations of members of the domain. But in natural language, we like to talk about all sorts of things, not just individuals, but also substances uh, and also events, uh, which can be linked to individuals via thematic roles. Uh, events and individuals can both be measured using measure functions. Uh, for individuals, a measure function might be like height, which map me to my height. Um, events have, have durations and, and uh, these measure functions map individuals and events to degrees in linguistics terminology. That's what in quantity calculus is referred to as a quantity. Uh, and then degrees like my height can be mapped via unit functions to numbers. So like inches uh, would be a unit function that would take my height and then give the number of inches tall that I am. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we like to talk about for each one of these ontological sorts we will have a type in our formal representation language, E for individuals, it's short for entity, don't ask, uh, V for events, I for intervals that are spatial and temporal intervals, D for degrees, and N for numbers. But these are Lucas Champollion's types. So we can actually think of the model as an indexed set of domains, one for each type. But it's even more complicated than that because we also want to have operations on these objects of different sorts in the domain. For individuals, we would like to have a sum operation that takes two individuals and creates a plural individual uh, composed of the two uh, so that we can talk about plurals. And a sum operation is often also assumed for events and intervals as well. And uh, so we have this, these sum operations. For numbers, it's never really explicitly mentioned, but I've seen many implicit assumptions that we can add and multiply numbers. And the uh, concern in this presentation is what's going on here in, this, in the domain corresponding to type D for degrees. Uh, what operations do we have on degrees or quantities, as they say? Uh, and, Elizabeth, uh, are, the, are yeah. these domains, are they disjoint? Um, or could, could a word be in two disjoint, domains? disjoint. But it's funny you mentioned that because in the shift from this kind of like more standard view to what I'm going to propose, I got rid of the numbers because they're actually, um, they're contained within the quantities or degrees. Right. Okay. They're a special... Sub subset of the degrees. <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, but otherwise they would be disjoint. Uh, 
and you could still have a type for numbers that might be useful for linguistic purposes, but we don't need to complicate the model with that. Okay, so here's some linguistic evidence that we have at least one ob uh, item in English that expresses the concept of dividing one quantity by another. Um, and it is the word per, as in they ate two olives per person. English per is like this quantifier each, as in they ate two, two olives each um, in a number of respects. So that might make you think that per is actually some kind of quantifier like each, a distributivity marker, as, as they say. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so each and per person both require a licensor. So you can't say they decided to leave each. They need to hang on to something like two olives and not any licensor will do. Uh, you can't say they ate those olives each or those olives per person or most olives each or most olives per person. Okay, so in the distributivity literature, the licensor for a distributivity marker like each is called the share because it's like, like the olives are being shared among different things. And then um, the things among which the olives are being shared is called the key. It's like, you know, like the key in a, like a key value mapping type thing. Um, so on a distributivity marker analysis, James Bond ate two olives per martini describes an event E whose agent, get it, is James Bond. Uh, that's the thematic role. Agent is the them thematic role. And E consists of one or more sub-events E prime. Each of those sub-events has as its theme two olives. And we'll write, we write that in our formal representation language using this fancy stuff. This star denotes the closure under sum of a predicate. And we've formed a predicate using the lambda abstraction operator, lambda he, here. So this is like E is uh, a sum of one or more events that satisfy this description. It's an eating event. It's it's um, share thematic role, which in this case would be theme, um, is a bunch of olives, one or more olives. The star makes, makes it uh, into a plurality. And the measure, mu is for measure, the measure of these olives is two along this card along cardinality dimension. Okay, and then these events are gonna be mapped one to one to other events, E double prime, which are each associated with one martini. And we have a formal way of representing that idea too. So match is this one-to-one -one function that goes from E prime, E primes to E double primes. And uh, there's these are just single martinis. Yeah, let's not get into the details too much. But uh, anyway, this is what the distributivity marker analysis looks like. And what I would like to argue is that what this sentence expresses is uh, that there is an event E that James Bond is the agent of, and the ratio of olives eaten in E to martinis drunk in E is two to one. Uh, okay, here are my linguistic arguments for that. You can say James Bond drove 100 kilometers per hour for five minutes. So the driving event doesn't have to be divided into sub events that each last one hour. The event could last less than one hour. That is not predicted under the distributivity marker analysis because maybe you don't need three events, but you need at least one sub event who's associated with that's associated with 100 kilometers and one hour. Uh, you here are some more attested examples, 240 steps per minute for 20 seconds, 12.5% per year for six months. So I'm calling these sub unit cases. And that's one source of linguistic evidence that, uh, we're really talking about ratios rather than, um, dealing with a distributivity marker. Uh, you also have non-uniform relationships between the the numerator and the, and the denominator, or as you would say in the distributivity world, the share and the key. Uh, so the Montreal Canadiens scored 2.82 goals per game. They, 
there was no actual game in which they scored 2.82 goals, but that's the average, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the distribution of her is also a little bit wider than uh, the distributivity marker each. So each re really requires an indefinite share. Oh, there's a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I, I guess I, I have like a, a slightly broader linguistic question uh, about like how how you approach this philosophically. So so with the example of um, saying like you're you're arguing that the use of per is sort of inducing this this ratio yes. um, is the idea that when people communicate, you know, you know, in, in English in particular, I suppose, when people communicate with each other and use the word per, the I, the interpretation of it in their mind is in a, is, is in a, in the style of like a, a ratio, like being comprehended as a ratio, or is it somehow is is this argument about it being sort of ratio like is it like on a higher level outside of like literal human comprehension because obviously like various people interpret language in different ways even if it's the same words so when you talk about saying that this you know syntactic or semantic idea invokes this other idea how are you choosing like with re with respect to what is that association being built okay so i mean i i am assuming that there is english and which is a set of conventions sure. um native speakers of english or competent mm. speakers of english have internalized these conventions which associate with the these words, these lexical items of the language, conventional literal meanings. And I'm arguing that the conventional literal meaning of per, which is implicitly internalized by competent speakers of English, um, is, uh, it's, is, a, is a certain type of function that invokes the concept of division. And I'll actually, I, I have three lexical entries for per. That I probably won't be able to show you all of or motivate all of anyway. Um, they're all slightly different, but they all involve the concept of ratio. So it's like my my argument is or my 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 claim is that the uh, the literal meaning of this word in English is not that it's a it's a, it's not a distributivity marker. It's a ratio marker, and there are other languages that have i believe ratio markers by these diagnostics if you if you buy my arguments if you think that these are convincing ways of showing that something is a ratio marker then i've found ratio markers in a bunch of other languages but only european languages really so far uh okay but I, I'm, I'm I got still working. yeah <laughs> okay um all right so another thing that distinguishes per from a true distributivity marker like each is uh, the fact that it can modify a gradable adjective like expensive. So you can say the guest found it quite expensive per person, um, but not quite expensive each. And you can't you can't rephrase this as for each person, the guest found it quite expensive, which you could do if it were a distributivity marker. Um, nouns like cost, which I'm calling dimension nouns. I, I think of their semantics as applying to an individual and giving back some degree, um, denoting measure functions, in other words. Uh, they license per, uh, but they don't license each. And what these things have in common is that they both have to do with degrees or quantities. Um, so that suggests that the semantics of per is like degree or quantity oriented. Um, and not just kind of dividing up the event into sub-events. 
uh, in expressing some kind of regularity among the sub-events. Okay, uh, and finally, uh, we find numerator per denominator expressions in this position preceding a comparative. So the heart beats about 10, 10 beats per minute faster. This is called the differential argument of the comparative as in five feet taller. And um, we generally think that that's a position where expressions that denote degrees occur. Uh, and that's not a position that would host whatever it is that a distributivity marker would produce in combination with its share nominal. So those are my four empirical arguments. If you think of more, let me know. Um, but that's it for my linguistic arguments. And I think the more exciting part for y'all is looking at the foundations and how they can be integrated into uh, a compositional system of semantics. So uh, in so-called degree semantics and formal semantics, um, the idea of a degree was introduced by Cresswell 19, it was introduced into Montague semantics. Montague semantics is this kind of like mathematical logic based approach to natural language semantics. Cresswell introduced degrees into Montague semantics, but he only gave us comparison among degrees. He didn't give us any operations. Klein 1991 um, in the same tradition gave us addition through concatenation of objects, which is has an interesting parallel in the history of uh, metrology, but um, no multiplication. There is some talk of multiplication, but we don't have cross-dimensional multiplication and division like before I started getting this project going. Uh, luckily, there is this field called quantity calculus, which deals with quantities, which I said earlier um, are properties of phenomena like the radius of a particular circle, the wavelength of a particular uh, radiation sample, the height of a particular individual. And your job as a practitioner of quantity calculus is to lay the foundations for addition of quantities of the same kind, product of a number times a quantity, and um, product of quantities. This is not a new thing, even though I discovered it recently. You can read about the history in this Dibur uh, paper. Um, yeah, it's it has an interesting sociological uh, position. In quantity calculus, two approaches have been distinguished, a unit-centric approach and a dimension-centric approach. Uh, Raposo is an advocate of the dimension-centric approach and describes it as one on which the dimension is an intrinsic property of a quantity as in contrast to its numerical value, which depends on the unit chosen or the unit itself, which can be changed arbitrarily. So like my height, for example, has an intrinsic connection to the dimension height, but it has no intrinsic connection to like some number of inches, right? Um, uh, so with this dimension-centric approach, you start with a set of basic dimensions. You can choose these ones that these seven that have official names and symbols, if you would like. For natural language semantics, we'll need a few more. Um, I think money for sure is gonna be a dimension we need. Um, and then the dimensions can be multiplied with themselves or with each other. So you can multiply length times length and get length squared or length times mass and get um, uh, a product of two dimensions. The set of dimensions forms a group. So if any two dimensions are in the set of dimensions fancy D, then so is their product. There's an identity element that you can uh, use to multiply any dimension. Um, well, if, if you multiply any dimension by this identity element, then you get that identity, then you get the, the dimension you were multiplying by back. And there's an inverse D to the minus one, for every dimension d in this uh, space, such that d times d to the minus one is equal to this multiplicative identity element. So that means you can divide by a dimension. That is going to be uh, very useful for us in uh, giving 
foundations for natural language expressions that talk about ratios. Yes. So, you know, it's uh, tempting, it's tempting looking at this. Yeah. It's tempting looking at this to go, well, some dimensions can't possibly be interesting, right? Like uh, ones that divide out in a natural way. Um, my, my grandfather is a pilot and not very good at math. And he one time told me something about his airplane in units of miles per gallon per mile per hour. <laughs> so since, since you're dealing with natural language, I guess it actually, in theory, all dimensions are theoretically interesting because people come up with all sorts of, you know, ridiculous things to talk about. Right. And, and so you can't necessarily yeah. like rule out a dimension just because they could be simplified to a normal form. Yeah, so there is a there is kind of like a normal form, which is just like the for all the basic dimensions, raise it to some power, um, which can be either some integer power, which can yeah any any integer, um, and the integers can be positive or negative or zero. Um, yeah, I I did start thinking about like what are the crazy combinations of of dimensions um, that are not interesting. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I'm just I'm just here to tell you what your sentences mean. I'm not going to tell you what to mean, you know, I'm not what what to express like it, with your sentences or which sentences to use. Um, if you want to say miles per gallon per what was it hour per <laughs> per mile per hour <laughs> per mile per hour, then by all means, I'll I will generate that. And I do have recurs recursion in my system, so I can I can keep going forever. Um, okay, uh, all right, so along with the dimensions, you have quantities. Let's call a set of quantities fancy Q um, instead of like D, the domain corresponding to type D because we have too many Ds around, the Q is easier. Um, we have a mapping from the space of quantities to the space of dimensions, the dim mapping. So like the dimension of like my height is height. Uh, and you can, if you want, you can gather up all of the quantities of the same dimension, like all the masses, all the times, all the lengths um, using the inverse of the dim mapping. And I will write uh, Q restricted to D uh, uh, to mean the set of quantities that are of dimension D. Um, fun, interesting, and also important fact, some of these quantities are what they call dimensionless. Uh, that is, their dimension is the multiplicative identity element. Some people don't like the term dimensionless. They think they have a dimension, just a very special dimension. It's They are quantities of dimension one. That's another way to describe these things. And ratios of two quantities of the same kind are in this class. So like dollars earned per dollars saved, <clears throat> you have a money quantity on the top and a money quantity on the bottom. And um, and it's like money over money equals uh, dimension one. And that's the dimension of such a quantity. Numbers of entities uh, have also been uh, treated as quantities of dimension one. Um, I'm actually gonna. I I I I got led. I got I painted myself into a corner, and I was forced to assume that for every different type of object that I wanted to talk about, there was a different dimension. Um, so, like number of number of water bottles is a different dimension than like number of pens. Um, I don't know if we'll have time to get into. <laughs> why I needed to make that assumption. So I differ a little bit from the standard view on that one. Um, okay, are there people who people here who know the algebraic concept of a fiber, fiber bundle? The space of quantities forms a fiber bundle, which is like each one of these is a vector space. Each one of these represents a dimension. Each row represents a dimension. And you can add and multiply within a dimension. Um, you can't add across dimensions, but you can multiply across dimensions. So that kind of bundles the fibers together, the multiplication operation. Uh, so you have um, a bunch of vector spaces, one for each dimension. They all have a zero element, an additive identity element. 
as well uh, as additive inverses for every uh, every element for every you know for every element you have an additive inverse and there is a multiplicative identity element on quantities which is taken from the real numbers uh, so it's actually the number one um okay uh it's not it doesn't form a group you can't divide by anything uh it it forms an abelian monoid under multiplication if any two quantities are a member of the set of quantities, then so is their product. You have a multiplicative identity element. It's associative and commutative. Not every quantity has an inverse. In particular, you cannot divide by the additive identity elements in each of the dimensions. But as long as it's non-zero, then you can divide by it. There is an inverse q to the minus 1 for every non-zero quantity q, um, such that q times q to the minus one equals one. So uh, we can divide by stuff. We just have to make sure that it's not zero. So that that's all we really needed in order to uh, lay the foundations for a theory of Kerr. Uh, just as we had a mapping from quantities to dimensions, we have a mapping in the other direction. For every dimension, there is a quantity that serves as the unit for that dimension. Uh, you can't pick the zero element, and there's a restriction that this unit mapping be a group homomorphism. So the unit of a product of dimensions is equal to the product of the units for those dimensions. Okay, so we will have a logic, a formal representation language, L sub fancy Q which is a version of lambda calculus that has quantity multiplication in it. Uh, the models for this language will be, like I said at the beginning, we'll have um, domains corresponding to the types E, V, I, D, and M, M for dimension. Um, and we will have addition and multiplication operations on the space of quantities and multiplication operations on the space of dimensions that adhere to the constraints that I've just described. Okay, uh, what time is, I think now is the time that I let you choose your own adventure. It's 5.30. I can talk for 10 more minutes or, and then just quickly. Yeah, whatever you'd like. I I think it's hilarious that you, at the start of the call, we're kind of pitching this as, oh, it's not that mathy and stuff and telling us about fiber bundles. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I got anything wrong, please let me know. I mean, so we could just like talk about those foundations and skip the compositional semantic stuff. Um, or we could, I could spend 10 minutes on the compositional semantics. I though. think, um, I think we should go in whatever direction is most exciting to you and drop into questions whenever you'd like. I do have one question for now though, which yeah. you can choose if you want to answer it after the rest of the presentation or immediately. But I'm curious about some of the, um, reasoning behind this approach. I think it's inherently interesting to try to find the mathematical foundations for per. And you make a very compelling argument that it should be with these different algebras. And I guess I'm just curious why this is the, the topic that you're curious about and diving deep into do the research for and, and what the hope is coming out of it. Uh -huh. So yeah, answer later if you'd like, if that's to a total distraction or yeah, but that's one thing I've been curious about. Yeah, so I actually, yeah, I, my, 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 pathway into this topic is a bit of a long story. Um, I I did this cross-linguistic project on quantity words like many, more, and most, and we found this kind of universal after looking at a bunch of languages. And in order to explain this universal, I needed, I, I, I had, I, I, I came to the conclusion that these words express 
quantifiers, a certain kind of quantifiers, uh, like quantifiers over degrees, many, many words like many, these quantity words. And then because I had committed to that analysis of quantity words, I needed to explain certain variations in the usage of quantity words that are kind of like too much to get into. But um, in order, like I, I, I was led to the conclusion that there must be degrees that are the quotient of one quantity and another, um, like through that other project. And then I thought, that's actually a really cool topic. And it's totally underexplored. I mean, so in English, the word per is actually very rich and complex grammatically. And there's, there's a lot going on in the composition, as we can see later. Um, and it's totally un, unexplored cross-linguistically. So we just had this kind of spidey sense that there would be a lot of richness to uncover yeah. by exploring the consequences of adding these new foundations. So if I can interrupt and hopefully not oversimplify too much, it sounds like based on your training and intuition of working on related problems, that the correct way to understand per and other pieces of the English language involves adding in all of this math and these foundations in this way. And that the compositions are sort of, you are saying, this is what I think English is really like under the hood and surprisingly yeah. it brings out all this math. Is that is that right or am I missing? Yeah, no, I mean, I, th I, I think I, I like projects that involve laying new foundations for semantic theory that makes me feel like I'm contributing something. Um, and and I, when I realized that we don't have multiplication and division in the foundations for degree semantics, uh, I, I kind of got excited because I thought we can we can add this and then consider all of the many wonderful consequences of it. But then I had to work hard to justify adding it. And so like those arguments, those linguistic arguments are actually post deciding that I wanted to do it. <laughs> I was kind of nervous that it wouldn't turn out that we needed these foundations and relieved to find that the arguments like were pretty solid and convincing. Um, okay. Yeah, that was, I mean, yeah. Biographically, yeah. that's how it happens. Uh, we, we like those types of problems as well. I appreciate the aside. That'll help me understand the composition better. So I'm ready to continue unless other people have questions too. I, I guess I would just point out something very interesting about this talk in contrast to other talks we host is that normally we host people who build a language to do something and they equip it with the features that they want. Whereas you're coming in and looking at a language that naturally exists and then empirically observing what features it has, right? Which is a completely different problem and like kind of fascinating uh, the, the difference between those two. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there's a, a an engineering component in modeling this natural biological phenomenon that language is, even though it's kind of artificially constructed too. It's a very interesting beast language. I like, cause we do, you know, there there's definitely a, you know, a deliberate, intentional, explicit component to how languages come, ex come into existence. And yet they are these like biological phenomena that exist in nature too. So it's, yeah, it, they have this hybrid nature, but yeah, as, as linguists, we are scientists trying to understand this phenomenon and developing theories through crafting uh, formal languages that are designed to capture the empirical properties that we observe. Okay. Uh, so some empirical properties. Wait. Right. Um, okay. So here's just a simple, super, super simple analysis of per. So it's our like starter analysis. Um, it is going to denote a function that expects two degrees. Uh, call them d and q, and then it's going to return the result of dividing q by d. So uh, per a, a phrase like five kilometers per hour will have the following syntax. 
her is going to combine first with its um, with its complement our then you get a function that is still expecting one more argument q five kilometers comes in i'm assuming that five and kilometers can combine um via a multiplication so, so the the meaning of the complex is the result of multiplying the meaning of one by the meaning of the other um and then you get a particular quantity five kilometers divided by one hour as the denotation for five kilometers per hour and with this technology, you can do fun little word problems like Sinatra walked at five kilometers per hour for 2.5 hours. Therefore, Sinatra walked at 12.5 kilometers. And not very impressive by GPT standards, but Chad GPT. But um, uh, so you do it like this. Um, oh, yeah. Here I wrote per, the lexical entry for per a little bit differently uh, with a d to the minus one, but it's equivalent to how I wrote it with a little fraction. Uh, so, yeah, those are two different ways of writing it. I'm assuming that walk denotes a predicate or a function that applies to an event and yields true if that event is a walking event. And then at is going to take this uh, quotient and link it to the event uh, via an appropriate measure function the measure function is subscripted by the dimension of measurement here. So this is a measure function that applies to an event and yields its like canonical measure along the length divided by time dimension, which would be it's the, like the speed of the event. Um, and then walk at five kilometers per hour would be a predicate that characterizes an event that is a walking event whose speed is five kilometers per hour. If we have among our axioms that we can rely on that the canonical measure of any object, individual or event alpha along uh, dimension A over B times the canonical measure of alpha along dimension B is equal to the canonical, canonical measure of alpha along dimension A, then we can capture that inference. But it, there is something kind of interesting to discuss here. What is the canonical measure of something? Because I can measure uh, like my height. I, I can map, I, I have, a, there's a function that maps me to my height but there's also a function that maps me to my height times two. There are many functions that map me to a quantity along the height dimension. Um, so there's no unique measure function like that. So, I'm, so there must be some kind of like canonical measure function. Uh, well, there, I'm not, well, I, I can't conclude that there must be, but in order to, to make this coherent, I need a unique measure function to be referring to. So I need to appeal to the idea of a canonical measure uh, function for a, a given dimension. So I, I kind of need help with the philosophy there. If you have any ideas, please let me know. Um, uh, okay, uh, so I have this uh, new product principle from which uh, it follows that speed times time equals distance. Okay, let's move on. Uh, all right, so that was the quotient function analysis. There are challenges for it though. It's a little bit more complicated than that. And a piece of data that shows that we can't just use the simple quotient function analysis is the absurdity of the following argument. It's estimated that 150 species per day go extinct. 150 species per day is a high rate. Therefore, a high rate is among those going extinct. This is like not a good argument, right? Um, and what's going wrong? The problem is that the subject of go extinct is not species per day, some number of species per day. It's the species that are going extinct, not species per day. So we kind of have to scoot that per day out of there um, somehow. 
uh, what we want as truth conditions for, it's estimated that 150 species per day go extinct, is something like, in general, if you have an event E, then the number of species that go extinct in E divided by the duration of E is equal to 150 divided by one day. Okay, and so it's expressing a ratio. Here's the numerator, 150, uh, here's the denominator, day. We're gonna measure events E along the dimension corresponding to the denominator day. And then the number of species that go extinct in E, that's like, that comes from the rest of the sentence. So per expresses a sentential operator that uh, takes into uh, consideration what's going on in the rest of the sentence. So we can get that by taking 150 per, per day and assuming that that forms a quantifier that takes scope over uh, the rest of the sentence. And there's an operation called quantifier raising that we use in formal semantics where um, like something like John likes everybody. We assume that like everybody undergoes a movement and creates a lambda abstract. Like everybody, lambda x, John likes x. There's there's this move, there's this operation called quantifier raising that like moves a quantifier out and then introduces lambda abstraction over its scope. So 150 per day is going to go under oh, this quantifier raising, and then you get lambda d, d many species go extinct, which is uh, like a way of measuring an event. Uh, here's kind of, well, let's assume that this is the formal representation for like how many species go extinct in, in E. Like, to what extent are species going extinct in event E? Um, what we're going to get at the top is a predicate that holds of an event if the number of species that go extinct in that event divided by the measure of that event along the dimension given by the denominator, which is time, duration, uh, is equal to 150 divided by one day. Parceling out um, the contribution of 150 per day we get something that's going to be looking for this kind of uh, dimension or way of measuring events, gradable predicate of events. Uh, and that gives us a new lexical entry for per, where it combines first with the denominator, then with the numerator 150, and then with some kind of gradable predicate, and then creates a new uh, predicate that. Um, is going to be true if uh, a certain ratio holds. Crucially, what we're doing here is like taking the dimension from the denominator and then measuring some subject along the dimension given by the denominator, uh, but by the by the you know explicitly mentioned denominator, we're measuring the subject along that same dimension. So in the natural language, there are three, three terms expressed, but in the actual semantics, there are four terms expressed. I don't think, I don't know if I'm making this clear to a general audience, um, but uh, anyway, so it, it creates a, an operator that scopes over a whole clause. And so we get, um, we get the right truth conditions. Let me see, um, it's 547. I think maybe I will just, skip that example and tell you briefly about what, about triangle equivalences because I think you might like them. Okay, uh, so this will also lead me to my conclusion. Uh, so I was looking in a 
Europarl corpus, which is the proceedings of the European Parliament, where they have a lot of discussions about budgets and fairness, and hence many uses of ratio expressions. Uh, at so I was looking for translations of per into European languages, and one pattern of the translational equivalence that we observed is um, this pattern here that I'm calling triangle equivalences. The cost of wheat is one hundred dollars per ton is one way of saying it. Uh, the cost of wheat per ton is another way of saying the same thing. The cost of wheat per ton, sorry, the cost of wheat per ton is $100. Uh, so per ton can kind of swing and form a unit with 100 or form a unit with cost or uh, a shortfall of 100 billion euros per annum is equivalent to a per annum shortfall of 100 billion euros. So you have these three terms, cost, $100, and ton. And ton can form a unit with $100, and then that gets equated to cost. Or cost can form a unit with ton, and then that gets equated to uh, $100. Or so equ equated in the natural language, like it's sort of a quasi-equation because it's it can't literally be equated because the cost is is a number of dollars and one hundred dollars divided by one ton is uh that's money divided by weight so these can't actually be equal and and money divided here m this cost divided by ton what is cost that's not even a quantity that's like a way of measuring things so what is divided what is cost divided by something that's nonsense the way to make sense of it is to introduce a fourth term on this side. So $100 divided by one ton is equal to the cost of X divided by the weight of X. That is what we were saying when we said the cost is $100 per ton. We can get that fourth term using the quotient operator analysis that I presented in the previous subsection. I won't go through why, uh, but we can get that, yes. Oh, I think one fascinating thing, if you go back one slide here, is that I, so I'm not a linguist, this could be total nonsense, but if you put ton as a value of one in this example, which it seems to be in the sentences, both of these equations are actually correct. And I think that's the only time they are, because if you solve for cost on each side, one is 100 times ton and one is 100 divided by ton. But uh, assuming that a ton is a quantity of dimension, like, I don't know, M for mass, I'm not distinguishing between mass and yeah. weight, M, M for mass, um, then even if, then there's no way that it could actually be the real number one, because that's the real number one is a quantity. quantity of a okay. different dimension. So I was treating it like a math problem, and then it is interesting that it solves in this like explicitly single case and no others which for me, I was getting confused with related to language, but I do see what you're saying. That Yeah, so in, in the quantity calculus, there's no way for the, those to actually be equal because, uh, or just yeah. under the assumption that it, that the dimension of ton is actually okay, mass. Okay, sure. Sorry about that. Yeah, because then these are going to be quantities of different dimensions. If you divide a, a, a number by a mass, you're not going to get... And uh, if if you if you divide like a money quantity by a mass, you're not going to get a money quantity, even if it's like the unit for that dimension. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. So this is what I think is going on on the right hand side of the triangle. On the left hand side, I think we're what we're what is what is actually going on is that we are dividing the cost of X by the number of tons that X weighs. So we're kind of scaling by, by a number. That's the number of tons that X weighs. So here we are dividing a money quantity by a number. It's the number of tons. And then we can get the equation to work out you have money on both sides as the dimension of the quantity. 
uh, yeah, it took me forever to figure this out. But then once I figured it out, it, it, everything fell into place. So I think we have yet another lexical entry for per, which is kind of like a lifted version of the original one that we started out with. Um, but it also requires a d slightly fancy assumption about the word ton. So I was assuming that ton denoted a particular quantity, um, but let's assume that it can undergo a meaning shift to then become a function that applies to an individual and then just gives back the number of tons that it weighs, its weight divided by tons, which is actually originally what people thought these unit nouns denoted anyway, functions from uh, degrees to numbers. So it's not that radical to assume that ton can um, have this denotation. And then we're going to lift per, um, I'm, I'm calling the lifting operation GG for double geech. Geech is a, a type shifting operation, that, a meaning shifting operation that's due to geech. Um, it's kind of like a double version of geech, which is going to kind of perform division at the level of a measure function. A measure function, again, is a function that applies to an individual and gives a degree. Um, so this per is going to expect one measure function, like a ton, and then expect another measure function, like uh, cost, and then produce a new measure function that applies to an individual and gives its measure along uh, the second measure function divided by its measure along the first. So we get, as a meaning for cost per ton, a function that applies to an individual and gives its cost divided by the number of tons that it weighs. So then we can explain why cost per ton equals $100 is coherent and why uh, there is that equivalence uh, between the two ways of, of saying things. And you can also explain why per person can apply to gradable adjectives like expensive if we adopt this meaning for per uh, and, and if we assume that gradable adjectives like expensive can denote these kinds of measure functions. So uh, I think that was, I think I did not go through all the details <laughs> with complete clarity, but uh, I think you get the idea that I've argued for three related senses of the word per and that they there's a lot to the compositional details when it comes to ratio expressions just in English. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. That was a very fascinating presentation. We really appreciated it. Um, I would say I definitely have questions, but given that we don't have too many minutes left, I would like to open the floor to others who potentially haven't asked them yet. And Elizabeth, do you have a hard cap at six or would you be okay going to like 605? 605 is great. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, if people are still thinking, oh, you have one go for it, Herbert. Yeah, comment. Um, yeah, this was really great. I work with a lot of people who use like word to back um, so they think about like all of this in this very abstracted space of you have vectors that you can add and subtract to each other with their like most common example being like king minus man plus woman equals queen. Right. Yeah. Like, work in this vector space. Right. But it's really like it's kind of interesting to see like, oh, yeah, you have these vectors that actually are going to like in this same format is like that are going to have these other effects that can be operations and these operations can vary in their function and all of that. So that's really cool to see. And then I'm like thinking, how would you put it into their framework, which I don't know how I would do it, but. Yeah, one point for deep analysis, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Elizabeth, I think in some way, it's really funny to me that Growing up, a lot of math classes, it was like, do these calculations. And then the real math comes to the understanding when you have to do these word problems. And then somehow you've like, you've 
flipped it on its head and turned the word problems into math in another way that was unexpected. And I'm curious if you've had any efforts towards generating these kinds of different um, like puzzles in a non-simplified form, right? Because simplified form is whatever it is, is per unit talking about, but you can generate sentences that have these complex things, but simplified down. I think that would be a really fascinating topical thing with a lot of the large language models to see how well they actually understand the semantics. Yeah, that I, I agree. Describing. Yeah. And, and that, that's kind of how I was thinking when I titled my first paper on this challenge problems for a theory of degree multiplication. Uh, so, I mean, I, I was, and I, I also did actually approach my colleague, Najung Kim, who's a computational linguist here at the U, um, about the idea of trying to, you know, build a corpus of like a textual entailment uh, challenge around these kinds of math problems. Um, she's very busy and she expressed a little bit of skepticism um, well, she asked me some tough questions. So we didn't actually get that far with that idea. Um, and then also chat GPT is so good at these damn things. Uh, it's really hard to think of a, like any problem that chat GPT is not going to get right because it, it's terrifying um. how, how good it is at these word problems, like better than, better than human in some of, in, yeah, in some cases. Uh, so I feel a little daunted sure. about taking on that task, but that is kind of, in a way, the natural evolution of this project uh, towards, you know, implementing these theories. Right? Cool. Yeah. Max, I'm going to add one more comment and then please, yeah. please go for it. But I think one interesting thing is that GPT is probably trained on a lot of word problems. It's probably seen a lot of them and knows how to handle them. But I would be really curious what happens if there's just a really weird word problem that composes all the same things and could be solvable by a human, but it's just like really long or or something that's not as coherent English, but still technically correct. And if it does something meaningful in those situations, I think it is still somewhat of an yes, open question. I think yeah, it'd be great if we could. Stumped, stumped, chat GPT, yeah. Um, I was wondering if you've thought about unit exponentiation. So an example would be like, um, we often write power set of X by writing two to the X. And you can think yeah. about that as being the exponent of the type that is of size two, which is isomorphic to any type of size two, to the type X. Um, and it's kind of an exotic operation to do, but I mean, people do it in topology is pretty common to take like set X to the set Y, right? Um, so you had Cartesian products, but this is a slightly different um, uh, operation. I wonder if you've thought about the linguistics of that. Unit, you're, you're asking about unit exponentiation? Yeah, so exponenting one, I guess it'd be one unit by another unit. Right, because in types you can you can exponent a type by another type. You can do the same thing in sets as well. Oh right. Oh yeah. Oh so right. I don't know. So if there's in the a way system, to say the, it the, in the English, quantities are the, the units are quantities. Hmm. We could we could imagine both like dimension exponentiation and quantity exponentiation. Um, I guess quantity exponentiation could just be defined in terms of quantity multiplication. Is that right? Um, I think it's more. I wonder if the same is true. For... Or I was. I think say, it's more complicated. Because you can define exponentiation in terms of multiplication if you don't need fractional things, right? So as an example, when we write two to the X for a set X to mean the power set of X, the reason why they're isomorphic ideas is that two to the X is like the set containing zero comma one to the X, which is a set of all vectors of zero and ones that is X long. 
it's size of X long, right? So if X has five elements in it, then it's all Boolean strings of length five. And then you can think of the, the Jth bit in that string is encoding whether or not the Jth element of X should be included in your subset. So that's how you get power set from exponent. But you can do much more exotic things. Like you could take the rationals to the power of the irrationals, for instance. And that's not something we can imagine in our heads, but it's a well-defined mathematical object as well. And you can't define that in terms of ma of multiplication? I think I'd need a pen and a piece of paper to decide if you can. I'm not entirely sure. This is definitely outside my comfort zone. Uh, <laughs> okay, but no I'm worries. very happy. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I have never thought about that question. Um, yeah, whether... I have the tools to describe exponentiation and whether I need the tools, uh, whether natural language could provide any motiva yeah. motivation for having if, exponentiation, uh, maybe. If you is. want examples, um, Knuth's, sorry, not Knuth, what, what's that book I hate? Munkers. Munkers' topology book has a ton of examples that he, I freaking hate Munkers, but he's a nice guy. I don't like his book, but <laughs> his topology textbook is full of these. Okay. So M-U-N-K-R-E-S, and you could find a bunch of examples there. Muckers, if you ever listen to this recording, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sure you're a nice person. I just am not a fan of the book. What's a better topology <laughs> book? Um, we had a, there's a good category theory based topology book. The problem with Munkers is that the appendix just doesn't have anything you wanted to have in it. And they like introduce things before they've defined them. And then it's impossible to find the definition. So it's kind of difficult to learn with. For example, metrics show up before a metric is ever defined. And then you can't find metric in the appendix. Like literally metric space is not in the appendix in Munkers, which is astonishing. Okay, no, thank you. All right, yeah, cool. Um, yeah. Can I... I feel like we're, we're out of time sure. and, and, and any future, I mean, and any real discussion of this would take quite a long time. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll let you go on this Friday evening. Thank you so much for coming, Elizabeth. Do you have any recommendations if people have further questions or are curious about finding more of your work? I, I mean, please email me if you have any anything whatsoever to say about about this or or about the connection between language and logic and math um i'd, I'd be more than happy to be friends <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much for the very fascinating presentation we really enjoyed it great thank you all for okay. listening thank you elizabeth bye, bye, -bye.